so much. It's so great to see many of you that I only saw virtually this month and exchange extensively emails. So it's great to be here and to get started with our school to university session. So we have four wonderful presentations, one after the other, and for each we will have space for questions. So, and I'm sure we will have many. Uh, we will start with the uh, person coming from farthest away, I think, uh, our wonderful professor uh, Lafifa Jamal, all the way from the University of Dhaka in Bangladesh, and she is telling us where we stand, or at least she's asking where we stand in our quest to empower girls with ICT and informatics. Then we will move uh, and look into the complexity of making sense of what is being done and how differences across countries, even in Europe, are uh, being accounted for and how we can define better interventions according to the countries we are dealing with and how this complex um, issue is still to be solved. And this is what Professor Robert Hanak from the uh, University of Economics in Bratislava is going to tell us. So uh, questions and complexity. And then we get into something a little bit more positive, if you like, something that has been already done. So with uh, Zeynep Tahin Samir, we are looking, in, but she will tell you her name uh, because I'm, I'm terrible with names. Um, she will tell us about the various initiatives that are running um, and that can give us some information. And of course, I need to read it because I tried, but it's really difficult. Um, and Zeynep is coming from the Technological University of Karadeniz in Turkey. And uh, she, she is the co-leader of the working group one. So you will see a lot of her today and tomorrow. And then finally, Dulcis in Fundo, as we say um, in Latin, we have a wonderful video because unfortunately uh, we are on the different side of the Atlantic. So it was very uncomfortable for our speaker to be with us live from Katarina Pantic, and she is telling us, um, I don't want to spoil the story, but I just give you a hint just to keep you entailed into this. Uh, she's telling us the stories of some successful uh, women in informatics and the ordeals and obstacles they had to face and what we can learn from there. So I hope we can find many uh, issues we can relate to and we, we are working on or would like to work on. Uh, but I give the stage to Professor um, Lafifa Jamal uh, so that she can tell us where we stand now. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And it's my pleasure to be here from, for, from Bangladesh. And I'm Lafifa Jamal, a professor at the Department of Robotics and Mechatronics Engineering, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. And at the same time, I am actually uh, serving as a president of Bangladesh Women and Technology. This is a, just a forum of tech women in Bangladesh. And today's my talk is uh, the say, title is the Empowering Girls Through ICT Education. Where do you stand? So I will mainly focus on the situation of Bangladesh. And as we know that like the girls in STEAM or girls in ICT, the situation is almost same throughout the world. This is the reason where we all are here. So I will just also give some uh, focus on other countries also. So, uh, if I want to say some about the population of Bangladesh, it is very much densely population, uh, populated country, 164 million people. And we have a very good distribution of male and female in Bangladesh. It's almost 50-50. 62% of our people lives in rural areas. And we have almost 30% of uh, people who are in between uh, 15 to 24 years old. So youth is almost 34%, 30%. And if we see the literacy rate, uh, it's almost same for girls and the boys. Like it's a bit better in the urban areas. So in urban areas, our female rate is 77% and 
The male literacy rate is 81%, and in the rural areas, it's 64% for female and 68% for male. So it's not that much difference. But what happens, we go to uh, the university level. Uh, so in the school level, the percentage of male, female are almost same. But when we go to the university, especially when we go to like for a STEM subject, uh, we find that there are almost 25% women who are pursuing their studies in uh, ICT education. But when we go for the professional side, we get a big dropout, of almost 50% dropout. So we find that almost 10 to 12% women are in profession. So if we see the labor force of Bangladesh, like in 2016, it was 16% women who were in, was participating in the total labor force. But in 2019, it's 36% in women. So in white eyes, we can say that there's a big jump from 16% to 36%. But actually, where they are working? Mostly, they are low-skilled women who are mainly contributing in our ready-made garment sector. We know that Bangladesh is the third, uh, third largest garments, ready-made garments exporters in the world. So mostly the women uh, works in the ready-made garments uh, sector field. So these are not the women who are in ICT, who are in mathematics, or who are in engineering field. So if we see, so this is the situation of women. So if we see the world statistics, this is uh, taken from our website, like 40% uh, of women global workforce are there. In only 70% in women in tech. We have 34% STEM graduates. The alarming thing is that only 3% women wants to take wants to take tech career as their first preference. So they are they are pursuing the studies in tech subjects, but they don't want to pursue their career in tech subjects. So in our country also, we find that they are going to other multinational companies or other banks, but they are not participating uh, like in ICT core subjects. We took one survey uh, among the computer science uh, students in our country. Only 1% female says that they want to pursue their career as a programmer. So we wanted to ask, why, do you, why don't you want to pursue your career as a programmer? So they say that programming is a bit tough. It's mainly for the boys. So a girl who are pursuing the studies in computer science, they say that it's mainly for the boys. So this is some uh, problem of the perception, our socioeconomic problem, or sociocultural problem. Like when we say about the ICT giants, so what names come to our mind? Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, or Steve Jobs or Dennis Ritchie, all are male. When we want to uh, memor uh, say, uh, say some name of the scientists, what happens? Albert Einstein, Newton, Isaac Newton, or Charles Darwin, or Stephen Hawking. So don't we have the women uh, personalities who can be our role model? Yes, we have but they are very few in numbers, and they are not that much well-known. We know that the first programmer was Ada Lovelace, who was female. We had Grace Hopper, who was the creator of COBOL. We have Margaret Hamilton, who was a NASA software engineer. And among scientists, we have Mary Curie, Rosalind Franklin, and nowadays we have Sheryl Sandberg in CEO of, as a CEO of Facebook we found that there are lack of women role models among us. And this is one of the reason that our girls don't have the role models. They have the role models. Mostly they are the boys. So when we uh, say about like the uh, SDG goal of five, gender equalities. So access to technology plays a large part in cementing gender inequality, especially in developing countries. So we have to give same resources, same opportunities to our girls also. So uh, in another study, we found that in our country, 
the digital devices in a family are mostly owned by the male person of the family. And the, especially the female, the students, they share the dev devices. So actually, we have to give the access of technology if we want to overcome the gender-based digital divide. And also, especially now in the days, we are in the time of the fourth industrial revolution. So we have to give equal opportunities to our women also to get the employment opportunities and also like entrepreneurship opportunities in the ICT sector. So what are the reasons of the women underrepresentation? So from our studies, we found that there are so many reasons. One is the gender bias in selecting undergraduate studies. We found that the parents play an important role to select the undergraduate studies of their children. And the parents think that mathematics, science, technology, these are comparatively hard subject, not easy. And the hard subject is for their son, not for their daughter. They usually don't encourage their girl to pursue their studies in science and technology. They say that, yes, you should take some easier subjects. And especially, our country is a patriarchal society. And the male counterpart of the family doesn't encourage or doesn't support much to the female uh, family members to go to, the, to go to pursue their career. Yes, we do have exceptions. The situation is improving from the previous years. But still, we have the problems. And especially, the female ha have the problems, the balancing the work and the family. We know that this is a common global problem, is the balancing work and family. But the lack of support from the family makes it harder for the female of our country to go to pursue their career in uh, ICT. And also, like we have some discriminatory organizational practice, like sometimes the women get the lower payment, though they are in the same uh, profession, they, they are in the same uh, designation, they are getting lower pay. Sometimes the uh, environment of the office is not much female friendly. We found some of the office that they don't have separate female restroom. So it's very difficult for a female to be in the workplace which doesn't have separate female restroom also. And uh, in a village, uh, in a school, so there were a lot of uh, dropouts for the female students. And another uh, organization named Amal Foundation, they found that there is a reason of the female dropout of the schools that they don't have separate restrooms. That organization built some separate uh, restrooms for the female. And just by building that separate restroom, the number of the girl actually increases. And also, like we have, I say, the lack of role models, lack of mentoring, or lack of networking opportunities. Uh, sometimes, the females don't get the security to be in the outside, like after the evening. So this is another reason, the security of the country or security of the uh, office environment also need to be increased uh, to give a female-friendly environment. Sometimes, especially when we work in a uh, Technology field, we need to uh, stay in the office after the evening. In that case, uh, they should have given like vehicle support so that they can go from their office to their, to their home. But most of the officers don't have the vehicle services for the employees. So there are a lot of uh, organizational practice in discriminant. And we have also like lack of, uh, lack of network opportunities. Like just a, a small story, once I was uh, talking with my students who is uh, practicing programming. So she, he, she said that my male uh, peers actually they stay in the lab till night, but my parents don't allow me to stay in the uh, lab at night. So I told her that this is the time of uh, the virtual world. So you don't need, need to be stay there. You can actually uh, connect with them through internet, uh, you, they, you also have some uh, Facebook groups uh, only for the programmers. And they said, when I post a problem in the Facebook group, rather than getting the solution of that problem, I got 10 friend requests from 10 unknown people. 
and that for that reason actually i don't feel encouraged to post in that facebook facebook group to get the solution so there are a lot of problems so actually how we can overcome those problems there are some uh, recommendation like we can uh, change our girls and young women self concept but it cannot be changed in a day it takes a series of actions series of programs and also we need to encourage our guardians our teachers also to motivate our girls and young women and like we need to provide training for education providers and teachers to change the gender stereotypes so so that we don't discriminate the male and female in the family and also in the society we need to connect them with the female role models making the internet safe is also a very good point because online women harassment is increasing day by day and sometimes the parent don't get comfortable to give internet access to their uh, daughter because the internet is not safe place sometimes so we need to educate them how to use internet safely and we also need some policy for online women harassment also so we also need some uh, we can also introduce scholarship for women in stem like bangladesh government they were able to increase the literacy level of uh, female by uh, offering different type of scholarships so we can also give some scholarship for uh, the girls who are pursuing their studies in stem or in ict so lot of things we can take so from we have another organization nam video asan bangladesh open source network we have a different programs so the program name is missing girl missing daughters and we introduced that program in 2015 and we offer a lot of programs from school going children to the university students uh, to promote ict and stem education here are some glimpses of the program like we start from the scratch programming for kids we do have program for both male and female uh, but we do emphasis more or for the our female students so we start from scratch programming for kids we do have some activity on robotics we do arrange bangladesh robot olympiad uh, and also some arduino based programs iot fiesta to promote women in stem education we do also arrange like science competition science congress bangladesh science olympiad to encourage female participants in stem we do have like high school programming contest so it's for both male and female and we are happy that bangladesh government is also sponsoring us for this national high school programming contest and do we do have a separate program for the female so this is called girls programming contest national girls programming contest so the person uh, in the front he is our ict state minister so actually he the our ict a division the ministry of ict they are helping us a lot to promote the young girls in ict education and like we don't only uh, organize the competition this is just a competition but we do arrange a lot of uh, programming workshop programming seminars even we do arrange some uh, residential workshop for the covid we are stopping the uh, residential workshop sometimes we do arrange uh, now online programs and see the result of introducing the missing daughter program in 2015 like we arrange national girls programming contest every year starting from 2011 in 2011 we got only 20 female students 22 female teams to participate in the program in 2015 we got 67 female teams and we started our program in 2016 15 the missing daughter program to uh, encourage women to participate in programming to arrange workshop to give the training and in 2017 you got we got total 384 teams this is 6.75 times higher and we are continuing this type of activities and it is also, I, i think in this it, it has a great impact to pursue women uh, in higher stu- the higher studies in ict sector also and we will continue our st- our things and i think we need some policy level changes tomorrow we have the work group meetings i think we can discuss more what type of policy level changes we can make 
to encourage more women in ICT. Thank you very much. So if you have any questions. Yes, there is a question from online. There is a question from Andrea Ianou from the C Cyprus University of Technology. And she asks about the slide, uh, where were the countries? Are there data from all the countries? Because she, see th she thinks it should be used, these surveys across countries, to make a data-driven direction, these dissertations. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, so we have data from different countries. And the more or less, it's almost same. The percentage of women participation in STEAM or in ICT, the percentage is more or less same. And we also give the sources of the data that we uh, get from it. No, more than a question, I, I looked in your uh, recommendation, La FIFA, that one is to give uh, uh, grants to women in STEM. And in Ugain, we have grants for women in STEM and about STEM. So I really uh, hope that we follow your recommendation and we encourage the young people to apply for this uh, possibility to, to, to have these grants. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It really means a lot if, if a person gets a scholarship, a prestigious scholarship to pursue their studies. And uh, so if we can give for the STEM, it will be really nice. I have a comment. Uh, I love your, your recommendation. I think it's a much good idea. Um, and some of what you're saying is uh, pointing to a more comfortable and nice environment for studying and working. And I think it goes for everybody, women and men. The concern about the family keeps dropping out in what we read and what we do. How can we tackle that? It's the most difficult one. It's, 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 it's really uh, very difficult to balance these two. Like, uh, for if, if I say, say for myself, so yes, I am very much fortunate to get support from my family. So before my marriage, I got support from uh, my parent. I lo actually, I lost my father when, we just, uh, when I was just 11 months old. So, and I don't have any uh, brother or sister. I'm the only child of my uh, mother, and she's living with me now. So I got full support from my mother, and even after my marriage, so this is very much rare, my mother-in-law told me that you should pursue your studies, you should continue your career, so concentrate on your studies and on your career, leave the household work to me. So that was the great support from my family, but everyone is not that much fortunate, and it's really difficult sometimes. It's okay that I am not supporting her, but sometimes I am not allowing her. So that's the main problem. Supporting her is okay that, okay, you can go, but I am not giving you support. But sometimes in our country, the females get the problem, get problem from their families, that they are not allowing to pursue their studies, they are not allowing to pursue their careers, and that's the main problem. You also mentioned the role of teachers in education. So there, I guess, we can somehow intervene and do something so that the narrative at least is in line. What are you doing there? Yeah, yes, I do believe that as a, as a faculty member, my duty is not only to teach my to teach like the subject-based education to my uh, students. I can also motivate my students, and also I can motivate the others. So as a faculty member, like I am also, though I am a student, uh, I am a faculty member of a university, I am aligned with some schools of uh, my uh, home, home country, and sometimes we do arrange a lot of motivational sessions for them, because we found that it is uh, the women, the girls who are already in the university, they are motivated. But we need to motivate, motivate the girls who are in school, 
who are in higher secondary phases. So sometimes we do arrange some pro programs, motivational sessions to, add, to motivate them. And once in that motivational session, one of the female students told me that, Madam, I am motivated. The problem is that my parent is not motivated. So you have to arrange the programs not for us, but for our parents so that they can allow us to get, to get here. Yes, I agree motivation is a big issue. Oh, we have a question. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you were talking about education, but I think that maybe the problem is more in primary education when they do have teachers that are women, but when they move to secondary school, the ICT teachers are always male. <laughs> and that's not very motivating. Maybe we have to do also something in the education schools to help uh, primary school teachers and secondary school teachers to motivate girls because they got demotivated earlier. When they come to the university or they're in high school, they already have made a decision. So it's, it's maybe a bit late. So I, I think, what do you think about trying to, I don't know if you can do anything, but maybe connecting with uh, the education schools where they are preparing the teachers for our young uh, Kids. Yeah, yeah, especially in, in our country, like uh, now the government uh, uh, make the ICT is the compulsory subject from school, uh, from the very much, uh, from class one to class 12. And now they are actually having some programs to uh, train up those teachers. As ICT is a new subject, so all the teachers are not properly trained to teach their students. So actually our government is taking some initiatives for the TOT, training of the trainers, uh, so that they can actually uh, properly educate them uh, for their students. And especially to, with that program, we are also incorporating this type of motivational speeches so that they can actually propagate the message to others. Yes, they're virtual participants. Oh, fantastic. I have two. The first question actually is from Lucia Hoppe, and she says, um, you refer to Steve Jobs, and it's sad that he didn't like to code initially. So there are also guys that don't like to code. Um, she says, I think actually coding needs to get rid of the boring reputation, uh, because coding is actually an art, a creative way of doing something. Is this what you were doing during your courses? Yeah. Actually, I, though I am now in the robotics and mechatronics engineering department, I started my career in the computer science and engineering department of Dhaka University, and also my undergrad studies was also in computer science and engineering. So we do have a lot of courses for codings, and especially uh, those uh, Steve Jobs is not, not coding, but we have Dennis Ritchie, who is the uh, inventor of the C program. So, so see, he is also a male person, but yes, we do have a lot of programs in coding. Yeah, that you, you try to make that a creative art <laughs> yeah. so that it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. And then maybe I follow with the next question from Hemu Kafu from Nepal. And she says, uh, when we're looking back now, when we see the, the current state of girls going in computer science compared to 10 years ago, are there any changes? And what do you see as the reasons in this respect? Yes. Actually, the number of girls pursuing their studies in computer science is, is increasing. And now we are saying that like 12% of girls are pursuing their career. It is also increasing. Like five years or 10 years back, it was like around 5% or 6% women pursuing their careers in uh, ICT fields. So, so both the number of students and the number of the professionals, uh, female, are increasing in our, in our country. And we thank our government that they are taking a lot of initiatives under the banner of Digital Bangladesh. So they have a lot of initiatives, they have a lot of fundings, a lot of programs to promote girls in ICT sector. We have time for a last question, just a quick one, if you have one. 
So I'll just finish um, thanking you for your presentation. It was very, very enlightening. And I think we can all relate to what you're saying and to some of the, your measures. They are really uh, useful, and we can revise those in our um, work, working groups. Uh, that will happen tomorrow already, or, or now even. Uh, so thank you again, Professor Lalit. Thank you. Lafifa thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And I invite Robert, Professor Robert Hanna to come. Thank you so much. So while Robert is getting organized, I can introduce him. He's part of our working group one, and he's one of the very active members. Uh, um, he comes from the University of Economics in Bratislava, and uh, he's going to tell us the complexity of the uh, area we are dealing with in terms of making sense of differences across countries, cultural differences, and how these, um, they influence uh, the way girls feel about informatics. Of course, it's a difficult area, and we are still looking for answers. So here, Robert, with all the questions. Hello, everyone. So uh, I start with uh, some table where we can see how the current status of uh, IT study is. Here we have uh, several columns. And in the first column, you can see the countries. I found data for. And in the second column is the percentage of the girls studying uh, at bachelor level at the first year or at the uh, university. Uh, and as you can see, there are big differences between countries. And uh, mostly, uh, when you start to make some statistics about it, these differences are highly significant. Uh, so question is, why there are so big differences? Uh, and uh, what's the cultural context behind uh, this? And as you, uh, when you look at the second column, uh, there is the growth. Uh, in a five-year period, and we also can discuss why some countries are, in fact, falling down in the percentage, why others are at the level close to the zero, and why some others are growing. And uh, in the next column, in the uh, yellow uh, color, there are some indicators which could uh, be the predictors of uh, when we are looking why this is uh, happening. And uh, I gave some, I have dozens of these indicators uh, which uh, could be um, in theoretical way discussed as have some influence or could have some influence on uh, the final percentage on the second column, which we can say that it's our dependent uh, variable. And uh, now it starts to be more complicated. I give you here uh, some specific numbers, but also I give you uh, some uh, general uh, things like uh, uh, world cultural map or some history. Uh, uh, and when we look at the numbers, let's go uh, how, to, how we can find out why there are so big differences. This could be uh, one way, some indicators. And we can uh, test it by correlation studies, some explanatory uh, studies. Please look at these uh, three approaches uh, I identify. Please take it more uh, as a brainstorming, not as a lecture. I'm in a way of searching, and I'm in a way of trying to explain why this is happened. And uh, uh, we can, this was the first approach is make some uh, correlation studies, make some uh, comparing some indicators. Uh, then we can start to look at comparing uh, the second approach, the comparing national scores. There are uh, questionnaires. We will, I will show you some, or some measurement inventories, measuring attitudes toward IT, measuring self-efficacy in IT, measuring many things in IT. And we can start to comparing countries in this specific thing. And uh, the third thing is to identify, I will show you in the picture, the measurement tools such, such as uh, gender uh, occupation biases and start to compare countries uh, in uh, those. So when we look at the first uh, uh, approach at some numbers, just 
just the brief view how it could look like. So we can start to compare in countries according uh, world value survey. And we can identify that, for example, Protestant Europe, uh, Catholic Europe, Orthodox Europe, are there differences? Are these differences significant? We have to have in mind that we have a small sample. So please, therefore, look more on the effect size, not uh, only on the uh, p-value, because the p-value of the small sample is usually small. So, and then we can start to create the regression models. Does this uh, add something? And uh, you can see here some few variables selected, some results of regression models. And uh, you can see when we add few related uh, independent variables, usually they are not very much significant. They are not adding uh, a lot. But uh, I will show you now some, not all, because there will be like, I have dozens of these indicators. And please look at the uh, relationship between the specific indicator, which are usually uh, on national representative sample or on national statistics and uh, a relationship to the percentage of the girls studying IT at the first uh, year at the university. And you can see uh, that the, I use, uh, instead of Pearson correlation coefficient, Kendall style, and you can see that some of them are uh, at medium level, but surprisingly, uh, some of these are uh, very close to the zero. And, and now the problem starts. Uh, how we explain, uh, for example, the gender employment gap in percentage has a high, very high uh, relationship, 0 0.34. It is significant, which is very surprise because we are a small sample. So the, there is a strong relationship. Very strong. Question is, how we interpret that? Because what, what from the point of the culture, uh, gender employment gap, how you interpret that? What, what, what is the, when you start to think more deeply about it, why less women are working in some country compared to uh, another country? What, what's the reason behind that? And now you, you end up in the problems, yes, we found some relationship. Question is, how we interpret uh, those? And we can start to create the clusters. When we create the clusters uh, of some factors, which uh, could be, in, uh, we, when we create the clusters of some factors, which could be uh, the predictors of, or in strong relationship with uh, percentage of uh, girls, then the problem of interpretation go up. So we can make it from statistical point of view, but I personally I think it's very hard to interpret. When we take this, uh, when we create some latent variables or identified some latent variables and uh, try to measure it. And what starts to be very interesting, please look at the last uh, part of the text. When we are creating complex models, multi-regression uh, models, and when we are starting putting these factors as a predictors, we found that those models are able to explain between 80, 90, and close to 100% of variability. So yes, we can create something which is able to explain, in fact, with 80% and 90% uh, has explanation power of uh, explaining why that specific percentage of girls is studying uh, IT. That makes, in statistical point of view, uh, that's a fact. Now it starts to be more complicated how we interpret. So when we put all these into the model, that model will explain one, almost 100% of uh, variability between the countries. So when we sum that, that's a general approach. 
And from these findings, uh, we can say that, yes, the culture does matter. We can measure it by many indicators. We, when we combine them, the effect is even stronger. How we explain them, that's a tough question. And uh, it's a tough question from two parts. From one part is statistical, everything you put into the model, yes, the model will be a good one, but statistical limitation, so we have to take into account. Second is theoretical explanation. Why we add this, why not that? Why so many, why not so few? Are they related? Uh, and when we look at more uh, statistics, uh, what about uh, collinearity and things like this? Okay. All right, so that was the first question. Uh, uh, second question is, there are specific measurement tools which are measuring, for example, attitudes toward IT. And I was very surprised when I was doing the review study that, uh, firstly, it is re closely related to the STEM studies, and the first indicators measuring attitudes towards STEM studies are almost 100 years old. So from the Second World War, and you can identify few between First and Second World War in the United States, uh, simple measure, uh, questionnaires asking uh, students at, the, uh, at their 80, 18 years old what you would like to study. So there is a plenty, I was surprised, of tools measuring this. And the uh, question is how uh, good they are. These are some I found uh, because when you look at the uh, number uh, years when they were published, some of them are almost 40 years old or, or 40 years old. And they, uh, from psychological point of view, I'm also a psychologist, they uh, lack of the proper um, psychological rigor uh, characteristics to be considered as our best tool. So some problems in validity, some problems not relate to theory, which theory does not exist at that time, and so on. Factor analysis, reliability tests. But still, there are many of them, and new are done. I will show you now uh, some uh, measurement tools to measuring, for example, attitudes and to measuring uh, self-efficacy. These are new, how much better uh, psychological measures and uh, allow us to measure the attitudes, uh, for example, to computers, uh, to measure uh, self-efficacy. This is the second approach, how we could measure the cultural differences. And it is, we will select the very good, for example, elementary computer science attitudes published this year. We will select this tool and And we will distribute this tool in uh, specific countries. And this tool, we, we start to comparing the results. And we can say, let's just example. The mean score in Germany is this. The mean score in Czech Republic is this. Is the significant difference between them? In which items? Where? And then we, we can have more detail, more specified, uh, knowledge about the problem. So this is the second approach I uh, recommend. But uh, when we are here uh, to do this, most of these questionnaires were published in one country, sometimes in uh, second countries, to how to compare the Europe or European countries in uh, these uh, questionnaires. We have to know the, we have to have samples from several countries, and it should be representative sample. Okay, let's go further. And the, I think this third one is the best approach we can apply. And it is uh, to understand uh, the problems which were already identified as a problems and to look if there are questionnaires or any measurement tools for that specific problem. And then we can start to compare countries in these measurement tools. For example, 
gender role stereotypes. We know this is the problem. We know there are the, some questionnaires for that, and but they were not uh, applied across European countries. So we cannot say that uh, the gender role stereotypes in Germany are at that level, in Czech Republic at that level, in the Greece and that level. And we can identify the more specified approach. Please look at this slide. It's, I know that it's hard to read, but I take it as a whole. It's a ECLAS uh, approach from psychological point of view of predictors or determinants which influence occupational choices. So what influence that you decide to be a doctor? What influence that you decide to be a IT a specialist? What influence that you would like to be a manager? And you can see plenty uh, of factors. Many of them were uh, already uh, investigated. And in yellow color, I'm, uh, I'm showing you those which are related to culture. So we know that this is a complex grounded theory explaining why someone is studying IT, why someone not. And these factors have some influence. And let's make more detailed approach. Let's look at a gender role stereotype, find the inventory, uh, test it in the countries around the Europe, and then say, this is uh, the level here, this is the level there, and uh, this we have to do to tackle the problem more specifically. And uh, I'm coming to the last slide. So I proposed from my journey and uh, when I started looking for more for general uh, indicators such as uh, gender, uh, gender pay gap and things like these and uh, so on. Yes, they are explaining something how we can, uh, um, from theoretical point of view, how, how can we discuss that. Let's look at uh, in a way that identify what is the specific problem in specific country, uh, which factors. I, I gave you a few levels of self-efficacy. I'm not good in programming. I get uh, panicked when I see the, this kind of problem. Negative attitudes in this gender role stereotypes. Let's identify them. And I'm in contact with a team uh, dealing with policies, and they are doing a really great job. They identify so many studies. I read their papers. They are great. They are, um, they are able to cover all uh, the spectrum of the policies. But I, I propose that if we identify just the example that in Slovakia there is low level of cell efficacy, then they can easily tell us these are the uh, inventory tools for improving cell efficacy or these are the policy how we can improve the self efficacy and then apply the specific policy for the Slovakia related to the self efficacy. It will be, uh, in my opinion, it's just subjective opinion, the most uh, targeted approach and the approach, I think, from the, my route of uh, going and trying to handle this problem, the best way how to uh, uh, deal with that. So in, from my point of view, did, I came to this conclusion and to solve it successfully, uh, I, uh, there, there need to be thinking and brainstorming in these two days to find out if it is worth it to follow this route. Do we have the capacity for that? And if yes, uh, are we willing to make some specific your country uh, research on uh, representative samples of these specific uh, things? And then we can say, in my country, this is the weakest point and this policy should be applied. Thank you. Does it? Okay, we have some questions. You want to start, Bada? Uh, I, I mainly want to uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, I, um, it was uh, like a super nice way to start approaching uh, it and it, it's, it's visible, it's, it's a long journey, right? Like, you, you, like it will take a while to understand different influences and then 
No, like, uh, I don't hear you very, uh, very well. So, uh, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just um, so with with this, uh, I I was wondering uh, like what is now the plan of like maybe engaging other other parties because it will be like a right a huge initiative. I mean, and I think it's great that you also have this proposed project on understanding differences. Uh, so that could also like move it ahead. So now, like how we could engage the rest of the action. Do you have like a plan how to like also distribute this understanding across the whole we action? We will discuss all of the plans tomorrow at the working group one meeting, but we will try to in, uh, engage the rest of the community as well. So um, what I think is very remarkable of the work Robert is doing is that he's doing the hard work. Is looking into mm -hmm. numbers, quantities, uh, indicators, discriminant, and also looking at models. But is also looking into questionnaires and inventories for us to administer and collect fresh data. So I think it's fantastic the order because uh, Professor um, Rafifa from, from Dhaka University was telling us how we have the same problem everywhere, and it is true. But uh, what Robert is pointing out is that there are different aspects, different indicators, different factors that come from the cultural setting in each different country. So once we have this agreement uh, and we have this very nice uh, system with all the variables that are so many, uh, we can start doing some intervention that would be very light because as you know, the, the, the cost action is this kind of object, this kind of instrument. Uh, we don't have people doing work for us, but uh, we have a lot of people willing to help, and it is uh, fantastic. And so the plans will be, mm -hmm. of course, defined a little bit better together uh, tomorrow, that is the, the working group uh, day. But uh, the, what I think is remarkable and very useful uh, is that um, Robert got started in getting all this information, all this data, uh, we are living in a data science um, world and we can use data to make sense of something and from the making sense we can move on into finding mm -hmm. solutions. Uh, yeah, what, one thing that I was also thinking, uh, like Robert, I will be just happy uh, to, to sit down on the, on this like basic information you, you now have. Uh, because uh, I was also like when, when talking to many people across different countries, I see like how how deep the different influences actually go. Like for example, in post-communistic countries, uh, the um, involvement of women uh, in labor market kind of like propagates as an information through these countries or the length of maternity leave uh, like propagates through different effects. And I believe that uh, still there may be a lot of still like new, you know, like, in, like engaging the knowledge of the people in the design, so I'll be just happy to, to sit down on that with you. Uh, I have some further thoughts uh, to what I saw. And, and I would like to add one thing. So this is probably the first time the most people are here uh, and to see that there is some research line, cross-cultural differences. I'm very open to any ideas, to any uh, proposition. Uh, what we can do, we, we can do it deep, that way, other way, and so on. And uh, the aim was to let you know that there is something, something is going on, I'm interested, I'm not, can I add something or not, it's up to you, but that was the presentation, what the aim was this one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robert, we need to say next. was one question uh, in the virtual audience from Simona Montagna, and she said, interesting presentation, did you try to make this analysis for your country already? So that you have an idea about which might be the influencers for the ICT domain? Uh, in my country, uh, I, for some indicators, I don't have uh, data. For example, uh, I'm, I'm from Slovakia, and uh, Slovakia was not included in that country, so I have to uh, collect uh, specific data. I'm uh, working on that and we also are preparing the specific uh, scientific grant with the team on psychologists. I'm trying to engage uh, psychologists in this and 
you will be very surprised what uh, question and what proposals they are offering. So uh, yes, we are doing also uh, and preparing a uh, few years uh, long uh, grant, scientific grant for this and being more in detail uh, for, to solve this problem. Thank you. I now invite Zeynep to come forward. And I try to pronounce all her names properly or, or even give up and let her do that. Um, Zeynep comes from a, another different subgroup and is going to talk to us about the different initiatives that are already ongoing and what we can learn from experience. So if you look at this presentation as um, elements of a mosaic, at the end we should get a, a picture of what is going on. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet you in person, finally. Thank you. And I'm Zeynep Shahin Timar. <laughs> I'm from Turkey. And uh, obviously, there have been uh, significant improvements in uh, gender equality in recent de decades. But still, there have uh, problems. Uh, and it still continues to be a big problem uh, so in some areas such as health, or uh, education, uh, business life, etc. And informatics is one of these areas and uh, where gender in inequality and uh, its effects are visible. Uh, the gap between men and women uh, in informatics is visible at all levels from uh, undergraduate to graduate or in studies or being a part of an, uh, part of an ac academia or leading in an academia or in industry. Uh, in UGAIN, we are aiming to uh, explore the ways uh, towards gender balance in informatics. And to reach this aim, existing initiative subgroup, uh, which is inside working group one from school to university, uh, has a role to investigate whether or and how exi as existing initiatives are successful in encouraging girls to choose uh, informatics in their higher education. Uh, to, uh, actually, to, fill, to fulfill this uh, aim, uh, we organized a meetup with existing initiatives. And uh, for, for this meetup, we invited different existing initiatives from different countries. And at the end, uh, we made this meetup with uh, eight ex different existing initiatives from diff eight different countries. These initiatives were Chiquitas from Re Czech Republic, Girls for STEM from Spain, She Calls That Kitum from Germany, Habitat Darni from Turkey, and Hen, sorry for the pronunciation by the way, and Hen Herias Porum Dia from Portugal, Women in Tech Brussels from uh, Belgium, Girl Think Tuzla from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and ITV from Slovak Slovakia. Uh, in, the uh, in the meetup, the initiatives presented about the, their motivation to start their initiatives and their initiatives work, uh, the barriers and effective strategies uh, they feel as an in initiative and the landscape of their country. Then all the participants discussed uh, in the breakout rooms about uh, the barriers in their country and effective strategies to overcome the, com com those barriers. Uh, within three themes. Uh, these themes were uh, role models, engaging education and learning environment, and these themes were um, deter determined by subgroup one uh, regarding the li literature. Uh, in the uh, first theme was role models. Uh, in this theme, we discussed uh, about the conservative gender roles and the missing role models uh, within the context of in insp inspiration. Uh, we discussed about family and teachers, and uh, the, uh, these are family and teachers in the context, context of encouragement. Uh, and in the context of uh, effective strategies uh, for role model, role model barriers, we discussed about how and uh, relatable role models shall be. Uh, I mean, uh, does the same age or same uh, program or same aim are matter, goals are matter. We discussed about this. The second uh, theme was learning environment. Uh, we discussed about the sense of belonging and uh, confidence uh, in, this, uh, in the context of this theme. 
uh, in the context of sense of belonging, uh, girls only spaces and like minded peers were discussed uh, as an effective uh, strategies. And in the context of confidence, uh, especially experiencing success was the uh, prominent effective strategy. And the third theme was uh, engaging education. We discussed about appropriate uh, education content. Should it be uh, more project based, multidisciplinary, or uh, how hands on it has to be? Uh, as a result of discussions about the uh, role models, the views of the uh, initiatives uh, were gathered under four sub themes approachable models, relatable models, women teachers as a models, and supportive parents. Uh, in the sub-theme of approachable models, in, uh, initiatives indicated that the role models uh, should be approachable by girls. Uh, one of the initiatives we used under this theme was like this. A role model should be someone approachable in their close environment, like university students, not famous, far away personalities. For example, include first-year university female students and let them share their personal experiences, which will improve the younger girl's confidence. Also, share moments when they struggle to be real and show that they understand the thoughts the younger girls eventually have. Uh, in the sub-theme of relatable models, uh, initiatives in indicated that uh, role models should be closer to girls. Uh, in the context of age, social life, or social environment, etc. One of the initiatives we have under this uh, theme was, the closer the role models are to the girls, the higher the impact would be. If the teachers that are younger or with cool t-shirt, girls come. If they observe the teacher is geeky with glasses, they don't approach. Uh, in the sub-theme of women teachers as a, a role models, initiatives indicated that uh, the women teachers are more effective in a role model. Uh, one of the initiatives we was in, in this theme was like this. School teachers could be relatable role models, especially for girls for underprivileged backgrounds. However, there are only a few female teachers at school, especially for STEM subjects. Main touch points are schools to reach the girls from all educational backgrounds. Uh, and in the uh, sub-theme of supportive parents, initiatives indicated that uh, parents should avoid uh, advising girls' gender roles uh, as a housewife or less active in business, business life uh, and support their dreams. One of the initiatives uh, view in this uh, theme was like this. Gender role beliefs need to change, including aspects, of, uh, aspects like what of carrier pets are appropriate for girls. Parents are extremely influ influential for the future jobs of their girls. Girls tend to reflect on their parents' thoughts and thinking, work and address the collaboration with moms and dads. Uh, as a result of discussions about the learning environment, uh, the views of the initiatives gathered under two sub-themes, sense of belonging and confidence. In the sub-theme of sense of belonging, uh, initiatives indicated that girls need to feel safe in the learning environment, uh, like girls only space, spaces or like-minded peers. Uh, one of the uh, initiatives uh, view under this sub theme was like, uh, girls are ashamed of asking questions in mixed classrooms. They feel more confident in, in girls only spaces. It is necessary, especially in the age group from 11 to 14. Extra dimensions in the mixed classrooms makes girls to hold and observe, the, uh, observe to understand. They observe this new dimension stronger. If they feel they do not understand this, they go inside of them and think and analyze. analyze. And they could wait for and allow boys to be louder and speak up. And they also should be in groups. They are more social and they are better in groups. In the sub team of confidence initiatives uh, indicated that instructors uh, have a huge role for confidence in the learning environment. One of the initiatives we was like this in this theme. Girls feel comfortable with instructors like them. Age range is important because it influences confidence. Expectation management is a suitable way to communicate about expectations and it redu reduces the pressure about learning and knowing everything before they even start the course. Instructors should meet at the girls at their own level and encourage them to learn. 
As a result of discussions about uh, engaging education, the views of the uh, initiatives uh, gathered uh, under three sub theme project based, multidisciplinary, and hands on activities. In the sub theme of <clears throat> project based, initiatives indicated that informatics education should be project based. Uh, this is one of the um, initiatives' view. Project-based activities make girls see what they achieve and make them understand better. It also helps them with confidence. And in the sub-theme of multidisciplinary, initiatives indicated that projects should be multidisciplinary. This is why uh, we need to present IT as a part of daily life. So multidisciplinary projects make them to see IT as a part of life. And in the sub team of hands on act, uh, activities, in, in initiatives indicated that uh, there should be hands on activities as a part of education. Uh, this is one, of, one uh, of the initiatives' view. Hands on activities are great because they see the results and make them feel to be successful on the project. Uh, these are the results uh, from our first meetup. We are planning to make another meetups during this year, and uh, maybe it could be in a uh, way of the focus group uh, interviews, uh, so we can gather more data. Uh, we are planning like this, and we are going to talk about this tomorrow. And t these, ah, yes, that's, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions, I can answer. <laughs> this because I can leave the microphone ready for you to ask questions. So first I, I we want to ask Rina because I think uh, your initiative is working really well and my general comment is that I can see a paper coming up. Very yeah. there. So Vara, please. I think you need the microphone. It is coming, of course, fantastic. Vara. Can uh, you move your yeah. mask? I can't understand because I couldn't understand what yes. Okay, okay, it, it will. Come up here. Oh, yeah? Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for presenting it. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, to everybody that it was uh, also a great experience uh, to invite these initiatives. Uh, we would uh, be definitely happy if any one of you is uh, in contact with some initiatives in your local countries. Uh, because uh, this one, this was like one shot event that we would like to repeat uh, if we collect the next numbers of initiatives. So it was like I think the number was good for one meetup. Yeah. Like we wouldn't fit more because we wanted to give them really space to discuss. But uh, like having the next rounds with with more countries, like we have the contacts, uh, but still we were not like. So successful to connect with them. Uh, uh, we believe that if some of you have uh, some good contacts, uh, it would be great to yeah. get in touch and continue with this activity. And I think especially like when we have the results from Robert, it will be really great because we can test some hypotheses on like what what works. Yeah. So it was like thanks a lot uh, to Zaina for uh, thanks, thanks. extracting all these valuable insights and and also like what was visible when we were discussing with these initiatives is that they typically don't have language to describe what is actually the problem. They, like, everybody repeats, yeah, role models. But you could see, like, with the decomposition that then, like, everybody means a different thing. Mm -hmm. Like, everybody just says, yeah, I think family and role models. Like, it's what everybody was saying. But then when we started to giving them language, like, what, like what specifically, uh, then it made a difference. So when having the data from Robert, it will be even more <laughs> useful, I think. Um, yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bara. Any question from the online community? No, yet? I think there's one from the... Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I am Tiziana Catarci from Italy. Uh, to, first, a short comment. I think in uh, Ugain uh, we collected uh, a list of uh, initiatives uh, in all uh, participating countries uh, that should be available just in case uh, you want to extend uh, the contacts. Uh, for instance, in Italy we have uh, tens uh, of uh, initiatives. Uh, uh, so one may su 
select the most relevant or so, and I guess there are also elsewhere. But my comments was on a specific slide that you showed, the one about the mixed classrooms. Um, mixed classrooms. Okay. Uh, okay. So in the slide, uh, it is written that the girls are ashamed of uh, speak uh, in uh, mixed classrooms. So I didn't understand if uh, this was a, a suggestion towards uh, letting them uh, staying uh, in among themselves. Uh, that I think is uh, deeply wrong, <laughs> because uh, we. The idea is that this is uh, a, you know, result of hundreds of years uh, of this kind of uh, politics. Uh, and uh, how could you expect uh, that the girls uh, lean up uh, if uh, we think that they should be in a separate group? So, so, but I didn't understand that if this was just a consideration or. Uh, the, the idea was to continue like this. Okay, uh, this was what we gather from the initiatives. I mean, they said they these are their experiences, and they experienced this. Like I mean, uh, the, like they said in the slide, uh, this is their experiences. Uh, they said that they they observed that girls feel safer in those kind of environment, and we reflect this like this. So this is not a, a conclusion. I think it's a very controversial topic, of course. And I think there are different points of view. And I think there are also different initiatives going on. Some where the uh, separation goes on forever. Some where there is an initial um, comfort zone, if you like, for women. And then there is a mixture. So I think it all goes back to what um, the first presenter was saying. We need to build an environment that is comfortable and safe for girls. That is also true. We don't want to segregate uh, girls. Yeah. So I guess we have to find the right measure in between. Uh, Bara? Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to add one, one uh, thing that uh, to the initiatives typically worked at extracurricular, like outside the classroom, as like informal education. I think that could have like made a difference because uh, for those, they typically work with the girls who otherwise do not join computing in the school. So I think it's great to have it mixed at the school. And for those who just drop out because they don't feel comfortable, then typically like they land in those organizations. So that's also something that could have influenced the suggestion. Because in those organizations, it makes sense because they take the girls who dropped out uh, of the education system otherwise. Uh, so uh, it was definitely not a recommendation for the general classroom. Yeah, recommendation. No. It, it was just insights from the initiatives. It's a topic we need to discuss tomorrow. Yeah, and maybe, I mean, it could be a baseline for the start. Exactly. And then, oh, sorry, mix the classrooms. Yeah, but I think models, um, comfortable environment are mm -hmm. all very important issues to discuss tomorrow. So thank you, Zainab, very much. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, now we have the Dulcis in Fundo uh, presentation by uh, Katerina, Professor Katerina Pantic. Uh, she comes from the Weber University, the State Weber State University, and unfortunately she cannot be here. So uh, I guess I need some help to get her video uh, started, and then you will enjoy a very nice uh, presentation with stories um, of women in informatics. Buenos días, Madrid. Muchísimas gracias por invitarme a su conferencia de hoy. Uh, my name is Katerina Pantic, and today I will talk to you about sustaining women's participation in CS majors or the lessons we learned from women who persisted. In the US, women comprise 51% of the population and 57% of students who graduate with a baccalaureate degree. In computer science education, however, women are a minority, more than in any other STEM field. In high schools, we have only about 30% of CS principals and 23% of CSA advanced placement exam takers being female, with some states having less than five young women taking these exams. 
In college, women earn only about 18 to 19 percent of the undergraduate CS degrees, on average across the U.S. This is problematic for a number of reasons. It is unethical, it translates into lost opportunities for women, it deprives the field of the necessary diversity, and so on. And it is a twofold problem. There is a problem of recruitment and the problem of retention. Retention or sustained female participation is the most problematic in the first two years of college. There are many studies that suggest women leave for a number of personal, institutional, and external factors. However, a lot of those studies look at the factors that weaken women's commitment to the major, which is attrition. As factors that influence attrition are different from factors that influence retention, it is my belief that instead we should be examining the factors that influence women to stay and persist in this major. Today, I will tell you about 10 such women, women who persisted in their CS major. Uh, when I met them, their average age was 21.8, two of them were married, four were in their final semester, and nine of them were working part-time, seven of which had a CS-related job. These women helped me understand what kind of social interactions and practices supported their sustained participation in this major. Let me start by introducing you to some of these women, all of which are now successful professionals in industry. This function represents Jane's journey. X-axis represents different events inside the major, and Y-axis represents her level of excitement with the major. So you can see that her journey was full of fluctuations. She started the major very excited. She spoke to the advisor, she spoke to her friends, this is what she wanted. And she, since she was always a good student, she did not doubt her ability to do it. However, since she never did any coding before, she really struggled with the introductory courses that were surprisingly not designed for beginners, according to her. She worked 60 plus hours a week to catch up, sought help in the tutor lab, and she was so stressed that she got seriously ill at the end of her first year. She passed all the courses, but at the end of year one, she seriously doubted her choice of a major. So in year two, she started taking business classes and introducing regular sport into her life to achieve that balance, uh, work-life balance. At this point, she was thinking of changing her major. Luckily, she went to a career fair where she got recruited for internships and she found a female faculty mentor who started creating opportunities for her and provided her with a much needed emotional support. Both of these things helped her gain legitimacy. However, instead of this being a good thing, she got challenged and teased by some male peers who believed she only got the internship because she was a woman, you know, a diversity hire. Even though these incidents crumbled her confidence a bit, she decided to tutor and help others and join the ACMW, which is a student association for women in CS, to help other women persist and succeed, uh, both of which gave her a sense of fulfillment. She also partnered with another female student to study together. Classes started making sense and she slowly developed a sense of accomplishment. The second image represents Joanna's journey. Unlike Jane, she never doubted her choice of a major. She chose this major from day one, uh, but she also had no prior programming experience. As a result, her first year in the program was also very challenging. She felt lost at times, overwhelmed by a lot of information and with no deep understanding of how everything is related. To overcome that feeling, she actively visited to tutor lab and sought one-on-one -on -one meetings with her professors. Finally, she started to have fun in her classes, applied the knowledge she gathered, attended hackathons, and she found her first job in industry. But she was also enjoying working on assignments alone uh, because this allowed her to pursue her other passions like skiing and biking. In her own words, she would go skiing all day and then sit in Starbucks at 5 p.m. to work on homework. Finally, uh, this is Shelby's journey. She started her college career in electrical engineering with uh, full support from her father who always told her she could do whatever she wanted. Her mother, on the other hand, did not believe engineering was a good career for a woman. 
and to compromise, Shelby switched her major to CS as a more mommy-friendly career. She finished her freshman year at a community college and took a break to spend 18 months in Germany doing church-related church -related work. Uh, coming back to the university was rough, um, so she found a study partner that helped her re-acclimatize to, to the college. Uh, finding her first in internship was hard, so her dad stepped in to help her. It was that first experience that helped her develop her own sense of legitimacy. As a shy person, uh, she said she did not need a lot of peer support, but she did practice reaching out to online communities a lot. Now, these are just three of the stories that I analyzed. As you can see, these women had many different differences in, in their background and experience. However, they also had many similarities in terms of social interactions and practices that supported their retention. Now, why did I look at social interactions and practices? Uh, according to Laven Wenger, it is practices and interactions that support learning inside communities of practice. I see CS majors as communities of practice and retention as an ongoing participation in that community. To become a computer scientist, therefore, a woman not only needs to become knowledgeable, uh, but she also needs to gain access to the right learning opportunities and she needs to be acknowledged as a legitimate member of the community. It was this theoretical framework that guided my study. So, what did I find? Uh, when it comes to social interactions, these women mentioned several types of social interactions that supported their retention within the major. Positive interactions with their peers, both male and female, were the most prominent and the most important, making 58% of the meaningful interactions that they mentioned. Their peers supported their retention academically and emotionally. Next, Positive interactions with faculty were also important for their persistence as they also provided them with legitimacy, educational support, and encouragement. What was particularly interesting to me was that all women used the tutor lab uh, during the first few semesters. So during that period of initiation uh, into the community of practice. Tutor Lab was a support system organized by the department and ran by senior students. Most women mentioned the Tutor Lab as the main reason uh, why they passed first year uh, due to both educational and emotional support that they received inside the lab. In addition to social interactions, there were several practices that sustained these women's participation in the major. Those practices can be divided into practices the women engaged in at the beginning of their studies uh, that were not always the most productive uh, and those that worked throughout their major. In the beginning of their studies, these women sustained their participation by finding motivation in a really good class or by engaging in practices that allowed them to prove that they belonged in the major, such as challenging sexist jokes or volunteering to do challenging problems on the board in front of the whole class. Mind you, this was not always the act of proving to others, but also proving to oneself that they belonged. During this initial period, um, they also learned to abandon perfectionism, uh, such as an attempt to learn everything, um, like every single coding language, or having an A in every class. One skill that was not specifically taught, uh, but was crucial to learn in order to succeed in the program, was the art of finding resources online, such as knowing how to Google properly, so you can find those forums and online communities that can support you. Now, needless to say, those initial practices were described as ex extremely challenging. The practice that really helped them stick to the program, uh, to use their own words, was when they found a job in the field. A job in the field helped them gather explicit knowledge about the field, such as coding with others or working on the same big code with others, and experience what working in the field would look like on a daily basis. 
another practice that was mentioned as beneficial was the so-called lone wolf approach, to use their own words again. Um, in, their, in other words, in addition to all the educational and emotional support they received from their peers, tutors, and faculty, most of these women felt comfortable spending hours working on their own. Um, also very important for their persistence was the art of finding and maintaining uh, work-life balance. Uh, for some, that meant skiing. For some, it meant having a minor in a different field, such as German. And for some, it meant making sure you have time for friends and family. Sounds familiar, right? But the practice that emerged as the most important was the practice of finding legitimacy or being acknowledged as a legitimate member of the community, whether it came from their faculty and peers inside the major or inside their work community. It was these moments that were the most crucial for their sustained participation in the major. Interestingly, this process was bi-directional. As much as it was important to receive acknowledgement from others, most women also felt the need to develop the feeling of competency from within. For that reason, they actively engaged in helping others because this kind of helped them uh, gain that or, or get that legitimacy from within. Now, if we reflect on that, we will realize that these women's retention in CS major was not a matter of learning and receiving support within one community of practice. Actually, it was a result of multi-membership. Yes, the majority of their learning happened inside their major, where they were supported by their peers, by faculty, by tutors and other, but it was also heavily supported by their work community, family and external friends. Um, I already discussed the role of work community, but I also found that positive support from their family and external friends uh, was very important. Uh, one person that emerged as particularly important for many women was their father who often served as a broker between different communities. Someone who would either introduce them to CS when they were young, help them find a job in the field um, during the major, or provide external educational support um, for some classes. Now, knowing all of this, how can we help more women persist in their CS major? As it happens, uh, there are many things we can do but I will use this opportunity to emphasize a few. One, we can make sure that we organize a tutor lab for new students. And we can train those tutors to not only provide educational support, but to provide encouragement as well, and to refrain from sexism in any shape or form. Two, we can be cognizant of our own faculty role in the retention of women and make an effort to provide emotional in addition to educational support. So we help these women develop a sense of belonging in the community and feel acknowledged. Three, we can educate all women on the importance of finding a job in the field as well as, as, well as what kind of benefits that experience has um, the potential to provide. On that note, we can also reach out to our internship partners to secure access to the right learning opportunities for these women. An internship should not be an experience where they serve as assistants, but they should really be merged in practice. Four, uh, women mentioned the art of finding resources online as something that was not directly taught, uh, but that developed Developing this skill was crucial for their retention. It was almost like a milestone. Uh, the same goes for establishing work-life balance. These practices are something that we can both teach and support in our classes, as we all know how important they are for any person, regardless of the major. And finally, and most importantly, we can model and nurture a culture where acknowledging women as legitimate members of the community is imperative. I had many gratifying conversations with young men who would initially challenge my work and were questioning why I pushed women into this career that they ob obviously did not want. So we have to take and create opportunities um, uh, where uh, 
to have those conversations, to legitimize female presence, and to explain why diversity is important for the CS field. Uh, those are just some of the lessons we learned from women who persisted. Thank you for watching and feel free to send me your questions. Saludos de Weber State University. I told you this was a very good presentation. Uh, unfortunately, Katarina is not able to answer questions right now, but um, she sent her email and she will try and pop in in the afternoon for the coffee break. Uh, so pop up with your questions, think about, about what you want to ask her. And I, I'm pretty sure a lot of what she said resonated with you and what you're experiencing or have experienced or are looking forward. Uh, I only wish I could uh, master my life, private life and work balance, as Katarina is saying but there is so much more time for us to learn. So I'm very glad to announce that it's coffee break now with a bit, little, little delay, but not too much. So please come back by 12 though, because it is more exciting, exciting presentation to come. <laughs>